This is Caradina Sale from the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy Research Center, as well as the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York State. I'm so excited to be here today with you, as well as our presenters, Dr. Tony Salerno and Deb Dana. Well, they're actually not presenters, they're gonna have a conversation. Um, so I just want to introduce Deb Dana to you all. And I think you're all pretty familiar with Dr. Tony Salerno, who also works at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, as well as the Community Technical Assistance Center. Uh, Dr. Salerno oversees all of our clinical work as well as our business and some of our peer work. So we're um, always working in tandem with all of our work with Dr. Salerno and others. So I just wanted to introduce you to Deb Dana, who's a clinician and consultant specializing in working with complex trauma. She developed the Rhythm of Regulation clinical training series and lectures internationally on ways the polyvagal theory infor informs work with trauma survivors. Deb is the author of the Polyvagal Theory and Therapy, Engaging the Rhythm of Regulation, the Polyvagal Exercises for Safety and Connections, 50 Client-Centered Practices. And she's also a part of the new Polyvagal Institute uh, that has just opened recently uh, with Steve Porges, who did develop polyvagal theory. So this may be a new topic to all of you. Um, and if it is, you're going to learn more about it. But also, um, really, what Deb does is uh, take the theory of polyvagal and applies it directly into practice. So I'm so excited that you have the opportunity to hear from her today, as well as Dr. Salerno. So I'm going to pass it over to you all. And then we will have time for a Q&A at the end. OK. Great. Well, thanks so much, Kara. And uh, also welcome from, from me as well, uh, as many of you who have uh, also joined some of the previous conversations with Dr. Tony. So you can see that this is really an opportunity for us to have a casual, just a casual conversation. Pretend we're at a, um, at a nice bar somewhere having a beer, and we're all chatting. And, and you have some questions and comments. And please feel free to, to share that. So it really is a pleasure for, for us to have uh, Deb Dana um, you know, participate in this uh, conversation with me uh, and really trying to attend to an area that we don't really do very much with. And that is understanding sort of the biological side of, of, who, as, of humans, of our human stress response, which is an area I think is really very, very important. And, and Deb uh, is one of the thought leaders uh, and experts in this area. And we're so pleased that she is willing to participate. So welcome, Deb. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Okay. So uh, the first thing is people might be saying, so what is, what is this vague polyvagal thing about this vagus nerve? Why, what is it? And why, why should we care so much? But the first thing is, what is it? If you could share that with us, that'd be great. Sure. So polyvagal theory is Steve Porges's, um theory about the autonomic nervous system. And the nervous system really is the heart of our daily experience. It is where everything begins in our biology. And so I love that we're paying attention to the moment to our biology and the way that our physiology then impacts our psychology. So um, the vagus nerve is the main part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And why it's so important is that it brings us this capacity to do what we're doing now, to, to connect, to communicate, to feel safe, um, to be connected in, in the world. And polyvagal theory um, outlines the two branches of the vagus, one being this one that helps us be safe, social connected, the other being a branch that when we feel um, overwhelmed in the world, takes us to collapse, um, shut down, um, some flavor of disappearing. And in the middle of those two responses is the sympathetic nervous system, which is the system of mobilization, which brings us fight flight as a survival response. So this is sort of the first organizing principle of polyvagal theory is this hierarchy, the hierarchy that we humans move through in a predictable order. So you and I are, are in our you know, ventral vagal, which is that safe and connected place. And if something disrupts this webinar, we're probably gonna to move to sympathetic and have some ang anger or anxiety. And if it doesn't resolve and things get really out of control, you, our nervous systems will take us to dorsal disappearing, to shut down to, to some flavor of collapsing. And then in order to come back again 
interconnection, we come from dorsal disappearing shutdown to a flavor of sympathetic mobilization on up through that to the top of the hierarchy back to ventral. So ventral vagal and why the vagus is so important is this ventral vagal component that helps us navigate the world in, in a way that we feel safe enough to be organized and, and um, connect both internally to our own experience, connect out here to others, connect to the world around us and connect to spirit. And if that part of your nervous system is not active and online, you, you, your biology takes away the capacity to do this. So when we work with the psychological piece and want clients, people around us to be able to engage, we first have to go to the physiological place so that we can have that ventral vagal system alive and working. So then we can connect in those ways. It sounds like, you know, I'm just trying to think when I was doing a lot of clinical work that, you know, I would be assessing the client, right? Where, where is this client at? Mm -hmm. I might be saying, well, you know, what are some of their goals? You know, what are they, what are some of the problems, the symptoms, some of the maybe anxieties, but it almost sounds to me, and I wouldn't have had this in my mind, gee, how can I assess where this person's nervous system is? Yes. You know, that's going to be like, from what you're saying, that vagus nerve is like pretty important. It is so connected to our ability to relate to other people, to regulate our, our stress experiences. So it's like really important, but it would never really come to me, honestly, Deb, to, to try to say, well, where is my client's, uh, whether they're children or whether they're adults or with the family, you know, how would they, what's their uh, kind of nervous system like at this point in time? And it sounds like what polyvagal does is it gives you, gives us sort of like a pathway to have a better understanding of where our clients are with respect to their nervous system. Is, is that accurate what I'm saying? That's, that, that's beautiful. It's beautifully put because yes, the, the guiding question first, you know, is, you know, when we want to connect with clients is what, what state are they in? Right, what, what nervous system state are they in? Because if they don't have a critical mass of ventral alive and active in their system, they are going to be in an adaptive survival response, some flavor of anxiety or anger, fight and flight, or some flavor of collapse, not really being here, just going through the motions. And when the nervous system takes us to one of those states, it is closed to connection and closed to change. So it's not that our clients don't want to connect or don't want to engage in the change process. Their biology will not allow it because it's gone into an adaptive survival state. And the thing I would say to that, that actually goes in front of that is before we can, can ask where our clients are, the essential question we need to ask first is where is my nervous system? Because unless I am in a state of ventral regulation, I cannot offer regulated and regulating energy to anybody else. So through a polyvagal lens, the first work for therapists is to learn about their own system and regulate it so that we can then offer that to our clients. You know, that is so important what you just said, because I was just thinking of the number of times where I was almost in a state of such anxiety and worry, uh, or at times when uh, um, I was angry at, at, at my clients because of, you know, somehow not following through with something or sab call sabotaging something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at times when I was happy if my client didn't show up, I can admit that now. I don't think I'd get thrown out of the American Psychological Association. Right. But when we have that kind of uh, anxiety and worry, mm -hmm. and then if we're in that state, like you're saying, if, we, if our nervous system is activated in that state, it can be very, very hard to connect with our client. And, and, and they're like, maybe they're likely to even pick that up you know, as well. So, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute because that's the, one of the, sec, that's the second organizing principle we want to talk about is called neuroception because the nervous system is basically uh, below the level of your thinking brain. That's where it works. And we have to bring it into conscious awareness to be aware, to, 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 you, to work with it. So Steve created this word neuroception, which is your nervous system's way of taking in information. So if you are in a state of anxiety or worry or anger um, uh, with your client, their nervous system through the process of neuroception is picking up those cues. And neuroception works 
through three pathways. It listens inside our own physical body to see what's going on. It listens outside in the environment. So simply the environmental cues can be welcoming or warning and it listens to other nervous systems. So yes, if you're, if you're mad at me because I didn't follow through on what I was supposed to do between last session and this, you're sending my nervous system a warning and I am going to then move into one of my survival responses because you are no longer safe, right? You're no longer a resource that you need to be for me. You're now a threat. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, that's such an important point. We don't spend very much time on that, Deb, I have to tell you, as a, as a whole system, you know, and, um, and, and I know what, what's happened with supervision these days, which can often be that place where you, have, you can actually have that conversation about fears and anxiety or frustrations with the client. It's an area that uh, we recognize, we do a lot of work in the area of, of supervision, where there isn't as much of that opportunity for folks. So you're kind of sitting with all of that. And there is, may not be a place where you can really process it to get you back into that kind of ventral space uh, in meeting that client, client again. So I just want to emphasize that for the audience as well. I think you hit on something so important and not attended to as much as it should be. Right, because we, you know, all of us, we, we, we think about certain clients and we might think, oh, that client is, is um, so difficult or non-compliant used to be the big word we used or so needy, right? And if we right. look through the lens of polyvagal theory, we say, wow, that client is really dysregulated, right? So difficult becomes dysregulated. And if I can look at my client as dysregulated, the next question then be can become, and what does that nervous system need to feel a bit more safety in this moment, right? Because that, and, and that's not my client's job. My, it's my job. So whenever therapy stops or, or we get stuck or something goes amiss, I need to look not at my client, what they're doing, but I need to look first at my system and how can I send more cues of safety and maybe resolve or reduce some of the cues of danger so that my client's nervous system gives them the platform so that they can begin to engage with me. Right. You know, you know what I think of when you, as you were describing that um, is that we can often be very judgmental. Mm -hmm. We, we can interpret our client's behavior in a whole, whole host of ways, right? And, and sometimes it's, oh, that person's being just difficult. You know, that person uh, is, is, uh, is, is really not committed to doing this work, is unmotivated. You know, all sorts of things. The, the, the client is being manipulating me and the situation. So we can, we can come from so much of uh, this judgmental place. Uh, and, and I think the lens, this kind of polyvagal lens, I don't know if you think this is true, but it, it can kind of help to um, really mitigate that, that kind of tendency to judge the patient's behavior in a certain way. Is that, you think that makes, does that make sense to you, Deb? Yes, yeah, it, it, it takes away shame and blame certainly on the client's end, the, the, the self-criticism when we say, it's your nervous system enacting a survival response. It doesn't take away the responsibility for then learning what to do with it, but it, but it takes away the, the shame and blame. And, and for clinicians, it helps us you know, look with compassion. And again, you can't look with curiosity and compassion at another human being unless you are anchored in your own ventral regulation. So it takes us back there again. If I'm looking at my client and I am just feeling really you know, um, hopeless about that client or really angry that that client isn't trying hard enough. You know, I am not anchored in my own ventral regulated system because we talk about emergent properties in this work and the emergent properties of a ventral state are curiosity, compassion, um, self-compassion, um, looking at another and being, wondering what's going on not an agenda, you know, we talk about when, when we get a little worried as a therapist, we start moving into some of that sympathetic drive that has an agenda. And I begin to think, I know where we need to go or I know what's best for this client in this moment. And as soon as I've gone to that place, I've stopped considering their nervous system, right? Now it's about what I know, but it's not a conversation from nervous system to nervous system. And that's really what needs to happen for for, for therapy to feel safe and for change to happen. Right. 
you know, I want to, I will get back to some of these issues. I wanted, it was curious for me is, you know, you could have done a lot of things with your career, right? I mean, a lot of things, maybe even different career, right? <laughs> we could all do a lot of different things, but in the area of social work, uh, there's so many different avenues and issues you could have addressed. Why polyvagal? What was it about it? You said, this is it. <laughs> this is what I'm going to commit my career to. Could you give us a little insight into what captured, you know, piqued your interest in this area? Absolutely, and uh, I love I love reflecting on that. Um, I have always been a neuroscience nerd. I've always thought that as a social worker, I am working with a client. I'm I'm, I'm shaping their brain in some way, and so I thought it was probably a good idea to understand how the brain worked. Um, and one of my favorite experiences was um, organizing a, a group of um, therapists to be able to be in a histology lab at our local medical university and actually um, work with human brains and see them sectioned and, and really get to know, oh, so that's the amygdala. Oh, so that, you know, it's fascinating. I love that. Not everybody does, but that's always pulled me. And then I read Steve's first book. I read The Polyvagal Theory and um, it was as if a missing piece of the puzzle fell into place for me. That it was like, oh, now I understand better what's going on. And, and from that moment on, it really became my passion to help clients understand because what happens in the brain is a result of what's happening in your nervous system. And so I wanted to go to where it first began, not work from the brain backwards, but start from the nervous system and work from that platform, which is where, um, you know, when we talk about this with clients, we say your brain's job is to make sense of what's happening in your nervous system. And so your brain makes up a story to make some kind of sense about, about the state you're in. And there's so many stories that are, we're storytellers, we humans are storytellers. And so we, often, we love story and don't we therapists love story, right? And so what I tell people now when I'm training people is you still get to listen to story, but you're listening to a different story. You're listening to the story the nervous system wants you to hear. And when I work with clients, I tell them the same thing. I say, you know, that story that, that about your trauma, and I work with trauma, that, that trauma story you've told so many times, but there's something underneath that story. And we're gonna listen to that story first. So for me, it was like get hearing the original story, the origination story, where does this all begin? And then, you know, finding my way to being able to share that with, with, um, with clients. And in the beginning, my colleagues were very um, generous in putting up with me, trying out all sorts of things. I talk polyvagal all the time. And they'd say, still not understanding what you're saying. So I'd try again and finally landed on a way that I think is pretty understandable for both clinicians and clients. And I truly believe that our job as therapists is to help our clients become active operators of their own nervous systems, right? That that's my job is, is not simply to help them solve a problem, but to help them understand how their nervous system works and how to regulate it so they can, you know, meet the ordinary challenges in a, in a much more flexible way every day. It sounds like in many ways, if I were one of your clients, one of the things you'd be doing is, first of all, you'd probably say, I can't take you. <laughs> Is, <laughs> some things are impossible. <laughs> you know, let's stop. Let's stop there for a moment. And I'm going to say I, that that I know that is a joke, but I don't believe that, right? I I I think the word that I use and I and the word that I love is yet. So we haven't managed to help reshape that system yet, or you haven't managed to um, you haven't figured out how to not have that response yet. So I'm going to put yet on you. And yes, we can still make it happen. Okay. you got a lot of guts, I have to say. <laughs> but you know, what's interesting is that part of your work is to educate me. Yes. To educate the client, like explain. There's a, there's a very, you know, almost a didactic process going on here, which is kind of unusual, you know, in, in many treatments, right? Is the idea there's a phase and you keep going back to it all the time where I need to increase this person's knowledge and awareness and really develop a language to discuss what's going on in the nervous system. Is that, is that accurate in terms of your work? Absolutely, yes. It, there, there is a lot of psychoed. And what's fascinating, because you think of psychoed with clients, you think, oh, it's very distancing. 
this is a, a lovely connecting way of, of gathering information because your nervous system and my nervous system have the same basic ingredients, right? They, they react in different ways to experience, but they, they at its foundation, we're all the same. I like to say the nervous system is the common denominator in human experience, right? So, you know, I have a mapping sequence I do with my clients to help them get to know. We, we do, you know, we call it befriending. You got to befriend first before we can begin to shape. So we befriend your nervous system and begin to get to know it. And I don't know how many thousands of maps I've done with people now. And you look at their map and, and you say, oh, mine does that too. Oh, mine does that too. So it's a lovely joining that we have with our clients when we're doing this kind of work and a transparency and a use of self that is, that is um, different, I think, than th there's a lot of that transparency in this kind of work because remember their nervous system knows what's going on in my nervous system anyway. So if I think I can fake it, um, I I've lost, lost sight of the fact that my nervous system is sending cues and their neuroception is picking it up. So there's lots of transparency in, in this kind of work. Helping trauma survivors really understand that the cues they're getting inside that their neuroception is picking up are actually accurate, right? So we learn how to trust those again and, and retune them in some ways so that they're useful in this present moment. But it's a, I found that trauma survivors are just so appreciative when I say, you know, you might've felt me get distracted and, and disconnect for a moment because my sympathetic nervous system got too big, but now I'm back and I'm here. Did you feel that in your system? And clients will say, oh, I did. And thank you for letting me know that because otherwise they're gonna make up a story. The brain will make up a story and it's not gonna be, oh, Deb got distracted, right? It's gonna be a very different story. If they say, no, I didn't notice that, that gives you another clue, right? That gives you a clue that they are very disconnected from their neuroception. And we wanna play with that, we wanna work with that. So it's all, it's all part of the process, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, what came to mind for me is this, this notion of mindfulness, oh. of very mindful, oh. but the mindfulness about one's own nervous system, you know, is to be able to reflect. I mean, who does that in real life? Like nobody does that, right? <laughs> I'm never, I'm not aware of my, uh, ner my nervous system, right? You, you, and then like, you, you know, if you're trying to tell a story about what kind of emotional state you're in and attribute some meaning to that, right? And so you must have like tons of stories that you've heard, but, and you had to need to shift that story. What, what was some of the common, you have a sense of some of the common ways in which people will kind of label their experience mm -hmm. in ways that is probably not very helpful because yeah. you, need to, you need to give it some meaning, right? But it's likely to make the, maybe makes things worse and it keep, gets you away from kind of understanding what's happening really inside. Yeah, and, and so you're right, you know, who goes around noticing your nervous system. Well, people who work in this way now do, we, you know, we call it the notice and name practice and we stop over and over again, just notice and name, where are you right now? Because it has meaning to your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and, and beliefs. And what I, the, the practice that I love to do is, is help people listen to the three stories that are always available in their nervous system. So in any moment, and, and you know, we might, we might listen to, your three stories, if you want to play along. Want to play along? Sure. Okay. So, so you know, in, in this in this moment, right? We're 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 in a fairly you know easy connection, I think. So probably you have a lot of ventral energy in your system, right? Yeah, I hope and so. So if if you if you then went to your sympathetic, mobilizing, anxious, angry system and just looked through the lens of that state for a moment, right? And, and thinking about, about what we're doing right now, what would your sympathetic story be? Well, what just popped up is I have an unstable internet connection, right? About, a, about 10 seconds ago, mm -hmm. and I, I got anxious. Yes. I said, oi, what if, because it's happened before, mm -hmm. and I lost the connection. Yep. I started saying, oh crap, this is going to go really bad. <laughs> right, exactly. And Deb is going to say, what kind of institute are you guys running over there? 
that you can't be sure that we have a, a connection. So my story would have been like, I screwed up in some way. I Love screwed that. up in some way. Yeah. So then that's sympathetic. See if you can go down the hierarchy to the bottom state, to that sort of mm, hopeless, despairing, no energy place. And what would the story be there? Well, the story there would be is there nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. Is the the sense of if I get to that state, is now is that I I can't yell at uh, Kara and others <laughs> about right. this. I can't run away from it. Right. So I'm kind of in a um, I'm sort of in a place where I feel kind of really stuck and trapped. Yes. And exactly. that I can't solve this problem. Right. And I'm just sitting with. A sense of embarrassment or shame. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, right. And shame is, is a common experience in that dorsal place. So you're trapped. Nothing you can do. Your nervous system takes you to that to that give up. Right. Yeah. But then if we come back to ventral together, you know, to this place where you and I are are doing it. And yes, every now and then you freeze and you come and go. What's the ventral story? What's the place from from this place of connection? What's the story? Well, the, the, really, the ventral story is. We've gotten through a lot of the conversation so far. You know, I'm not problem solving, right? And saying, if I did disconnect, I have two very capable colleagues who will be able to kind of take over. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks have already put in a, a lot of chat questions. So we don't, we don't have a lack of questions at all. And so I would be in a place of where I can actually engage in some problem solving and a little less catastrophizing. I love it. I love it. See? And so you've got those three stories are alive in your system, right? And so what we do with clients is we help them listen to the three stories that are always waiting to be heard. And the story that you are inhabiting comes from the state that is most active in that moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's making so much sense to me is to kind of one way of thinking about where the person is, is what story are they on? Are they gift me? So mm -hmm. it's like I have to I have to wire them up to some kind of physiological monitoring machine <laughs> to get a sense of it. Is that I I the kind of story that a person is is sharing about their trauma or and maybe not just about trauma. You know, this is about like the human stress response, right? So it doesn't have to be around serious traumatic experiences. It sounds to me is that is that most people we're working with. There's a lot of stress going on in their lives and where they, which story they're kind of telling themselves about the state that they're in uh, tells you a lot. Yeah. And that gives you like sort of indicated. So that, it made more sense as we went through this little kind That's of like Oprah situation. Yeah. And to remember that, that the goal for we humans, that, that well-being is not defined by a nervous system that is always in that regulated state, state of ventral. That is not well-being. Well-being, is the ability to, to know when I am leaving ventral and having a survival response and be able to find my way back to ventral um, as the response is no longer needed or as I um, find the resources to come back. So it's not the leaving that causes suffering, it's the getting stuck in sympathetic or dorsal. That causes both physical and psychological suffering. So, you know, a resilient system is a system that can flexibly move in and out of state. So I just want people to, to know that, that none of us are in ventral all the time, nor, nor is that the, the goal for any of us. Right, we wouldn't be human if we were in ventral, you know, like all the time. And we wouldn't be encountering challenges in our lives, you know, that, you know, that kind of a thing. And we wouldn't have the necessary survival responses when right. we actually are in a dangerous moment. Yep, so you know, that's, it isn't like there's a defect in our wiring. Mm -hmm. Is, that's a good point to make, though. You know, it isn't like, gee, you're in dorsal or something that there's something defective. Well, you happen to have a defective nervous system, and I don't. Yeah. You know, it, it isn't that. Can you say a little bit more about, you know, that? That's yeah. 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 Yes. Um, you know, when, when we talk about survival responses, we always put the word adaptive in front of it because your nervous system is simply an acting response because it, it is sensing danger. And, you know, I like to think about the fact that we all have a home in ventral and that I think our nervous system inherently knows how to get there and longs to be there. And our job in the helping professions is to help our clients uncover those pathways. 
you know, they're, they're, they're there. They may have been covered up or um, not used um, as often, but they're not working as efficiently as our clients want, but they're there. So that's our home, right? We have this home. And then, you know, I do what I call autonomic profiles. We have a home away from home in one of our survival states, which doesn't mean we don't visit both of them, but it means that our system has been shaped over the course of our life experience to find um, more safety and end up in one of those two survival states more often. So my home away from home is dorsal, right? I go quickly through sympathetic. I don't have a lot of sympathetic charge. I go to dorsal to that place of disappearing, becoming invisible because growing up, that was the place my nervous system found safety and it just has continued that on. It doesn't mean that I get stuck there anymore. I've done lots of my own work around that, but I can, but it's there and I know, you know, it's sort of like, oh, it's going to come to the rescue when needed. And yours might be sympathetic. You might find yourself more in a sympathetic home away from home. I don't know. Where's your home away from home? Me, my, uh, sort of my, my comfort zone. Yeah. When you have a survival. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, you know, I play guitar. And so for me, music is a place that I can uh, go to and, uh, and I do it on a regular basis. What? And I know it's my personal medicine. And so, you know, and, and I never think of it in terms of what part of my nervous system am I trying to, you know, activate at this point, but I certainly see the reduction in intention. And it's something that I re rely on a great, a great, a great. It's a lovely, both a pathway back home to ventral and a deepening of your experience there, which is what we're looking for. When you get dysregulated, are you more often in sympathetic or dorsal? Where do you go in your dysregulation? I'm probably more in sympathetic. Yeah. I get more activated. You picked up on that, Deb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, more, I'm more activated. I'm either going to find a, a strategy where I just got to, you know, sort of get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. I have to confront it in some, you know, in some way. Yeah. So I think that that's probably my, yeah. you know, yeah. typical way of kind of, of, of responding. So your home away from home is sympathetic. You have a lot of energy that floods your system to, in an action taking thing. Yeah, and my home away from home is yes. dorsal, where I don't have energy, I disappear. So it's just, and neither one is right or wrong. It, it's just interesting to, to get to know our systems. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a fascinating, I wouldn't even think of some of these questions at all, and that's what you're kind of getting me to understand. Because I think, how do you get at the nervous system, right? And you're giving us some insights into how you get that and how you engage somebody in the conversation. Mm -hmm. now, when, it, when it comes to like with children or you know kids, um, do you see like some of the possibilities or maybe some of the limits uh, to this approach when you're you know working with children? Yeah. So so the the possibilities are are, are wonderful if you have the adults or the systems around those kids um, also um, understanding and, and having some regulation because kids need regulated nervous systems in order to regulate themselves, right? Um, the, the limitations are, you know, we all have worked with many kids for whom they're, they're the people around them and their environments bring no regulation. They're, they're dysregulated adults in dangerous environments and that makes it difficult. And if we're working with those kids, what we need to hang on to is the time they are with us is the disconfirming experience for their nervous system, the new experience, and the nervous system will take that in and will hold on to it so that it can begin to build, those micro moments can build, and hopefully at some point there will be enough of those micro moments so that it reaches a tipping point and something else can happen. But for those of us who work with kids, we, we know that the work really is with the adults around those kids in the systems, yeah. Right, and with those adults um, and approaching it from almost a family environment kind of experience, mm -hmm. it, the way in which that's, it's almost like how that system operates from neurological, from a nervous system like level. Yes. And how the various players in that, it, mm -hmm. it sound, it can get a little, it can feel a little complicated to me. I don't know if, you know, it's, it's I would just see it as a kind of a challenging or it, it, yeah, because if you're, you know, if you're working with an individual, you're working with two nervous systems, mine and the other person's. Right. And as soon as you add more people, you add more nervous systems. And that's why, it's, you know, the therapist has to be so anchored in ventral because they have to 
be able to connect with all these other nervous systems and help find regulation. It's um, it's a dance that we do, and, and you know, for those of us who like couples work, it's a it's that kind of work, except it's on a nervous system level. It's it's yeah. like regulation so that things can emerge because when we we find our way to ventral, all sorts of new stories and options emerge because the they're in there anyway they but they need that anchor and ventral in order for that to emerge so it's a lovely experience you know i i i very rarely problem solve with my clients because i know if i can just help them come to ventral and we can inhabit that space together they're going to think of things that i never would have thought of right it's a beautiful experience to have happen mm. well you know it you, you're giving almost another definition to when we we talk about the therapeutic alliance and therapeutic relationship it has a really different kind of like twist it's it's sort of a rec it's it's going beyond the issue of of you know empathy and listening which are critical you know aspects of this but you're 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 kind of kicking it up to another level it sounds to me in terms of for us to do our work together and for us to make progress in terms of the service and treatment we got to have sort of our nervous system's got to be like working in the right direction. Is that is that is that sort of accurate? And, yes. and both yeah. sides, both sides have to have a nervous system that really can can de direct its energy towards you know whatever problem solving, goal setting, whatever whatever the needs are of the person. Yeah, yeah, I love the way you say that because it does it, it gives it does give a, a, a another layer to the therapeutic alliance. It also gives me a way to track that alliance more than just you know hearing words i track my nervous system i track the connection there's a measurement to it and i i can um, talk about it with my client in this way you know which you know as we're getting ready to do q a in a bit we want to talk for a minute about the third organizing principle of polyvagal theory which is co-regulation and co-regulation is a biological imperative meaning that we don't survive without it Right. And that's true when we come into the world, we need to be met by another being in order to survive, but that never goes away. And for many of our clients, people are dangerous, right? And so co-regulation is terrifying on a nervous system level. And then of course, on a story level, on a brain level. And so right. that therapeutic alliance is this gentle dipping into these moments of safe co-regulation so that the client can have that experience and then the nervous system can find safety and, and be ready for more. So wow. that's, that's terrific. You know, a lot of folks have been typing in comments and have questions and all. So I'm just gonna go to uh, either Kara or Fung of any, if you wanna, cause there's so much out here, maybe to some of the, um, maybe you see some common <clears throat> trends in some of the questions, that would be great. Yes, there. This is so wonderful. I'm, you know, everybody's realizing we're learning the language of our nervous systems today, and they're bringing a lot of thoughts and questions to the table. So, let's start with um, a question. Someone was asking specifically around borderline personality patients. So, we have, can we use polyvagal with borderline personality patients? Um, specifically quiet borderline where emotions are targeted inward versus the traditional outward. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I love that we can start with a diagnosis because then we can throw out the DSM, right? <laughs> Which anyway, um, because if we look at diagnoses through the lens of the nervous system, what we're really seeing is a dysregulated nervous system that dysregulates in particular ways. And so someone with a borderline you know, diagnosis, you're seeing sympathetic and dorsal um, moving in a loop, right? So there's this, you know, great energy reaching, 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 and then a disappearing, you know? So, so I need you, I don't want you, I need you, all of these things. We're in a nervous system that can't find its way to ventral regulation. So, you know, yes, you can work with someone with that diagnosis. And I, I sound like a broken record when I teach because people say, oh, what do I do with my anxious client or my depressed client or my you know, client with borderline? It's, it's all the same. You are teaching them to understand their nervous system and begin to regulate so there's more ventral because then everything else changes. So that's, that's, what I would, that's where I would start, no matter what the diagnosis. And even we have discovered with a bunch of physical 
um, um, symptoms. The same is true, regulate the nervous system and physical things begin to disappear. Medically unexplained symptoms are a great example of this. So it, it's that ability to regulate and then have my client be able to you know, do that on their own, not just with me. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. What are your thoughts around tapping? Some people are asking about tapping. Yeah, so um, EFT is, is a, a fascinating um, um, energy practice. Um, and actually in Steve's in my um, book, Clinical Applications, where we had a lot of people write chapters, um, Bob Schwartz wrote a chapter for us around energy psychology and polyvagal theory. Um, it, where, you know, when we're tapping here, you know, we're actually tapping on the um, social engagement system, the cranial nerves of the social engagement system. So in some ways you are physically bringing them alive, which is um, necessary and will begin to open up your ventral vagal pathways. So there is some, you know, thought about that. I love, you know, if we're tapping um, with a client, we are bringing our ventral energy to create the safety to do that. And again, it's about co-regulation. So underneath the specifics of EFT, again, is the nervous system. And I guess I would expand that to say, whatever modality you're working with, you are first working with the nervous system. And so whatever it is you're doing, EMDR, IFS, AEDP, anything you're doing, you're working with that client's nervous system. And so where I would want to start is creating that, that understanding of the nervous system and then add the modality on top of it. Great, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, someone, a uh, few people are asking about medication. Is there, is there a role of medication here in helping people to access their ventral nervous system? Yeah, so um, yes, there is a role for medication. If you have a client that, you know, you spend um, 55 out of your 60 minutes with them, helping them get to a moment of ventral, and that happens over and over and over, you're not making any headway, then it may be that a medication will give their system enough of a break so that you can work to find their own um, embodied ventral because medications um, don't bring your ventral alive. They, they're going to calm sympathetic or bring a little more sympathetic depending on if it's an anti-anxiety or an antidepressant. It's going to, it's going to work with those survival states, but it's not going to bring ventral alive. It may make the space for you then to work with your client to bring ventral. So when I work with clients who are on medications, I really like working with a med provider who is willing to um, sort of assess and not just say, we're going to put them on this and they'll be on it forever because the system is going to reshape. And then we need to see how much of this medication is still needed. Mm. Wonderful. So helpful. Everyone is loving this and getting there's so much uh, communication happening in the chat. Good. Um, so they want more reading. So we're going to send out some of uh, some of that when we send out the recording. Um, they want your emails. Is that okay to give out all of your contact information? Sure. Yeah. If people go to go to um, the best way is go to rhythmofregulation.com because then they'll get my great um, email there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We'll chat that in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Let me, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, I'm just, because I'm, I'm reading some of the comments and all and some questions. And what's come to mind for me is um, whether this approach kind of uh, can be integrated into other things that folks are doing, whether it's they have a CBT, motor mm -hmm. viewing, you know, and, and, or is it incompatible with some other kinds of, of treatments. So, you know, I think that's gonna be a, a big question that people are kind of asking. Do I have to like now develop a whole new way of <laughs> Right, yes. It's just an element yeah. that I can introduce that mm -hmm. can live comfortably alongside uh, my other approaches. Yeah. And, and I, I get that all the time. And I start my trainings with, um, you all come with expertise in all sorts of areas and you are, Many people are very seasoned clinicians. And what I'm asking you to do is, is to be open to putting this lens underneath what you already know how to do. Because, you know, people, we, you know, clinicians are, are intuitive and we make decisions based on our neuroception. We just don't call it that. 
And what I'm offering people with a polynagal perspective is the science that goes under what they're doing so that you can explain that to a client. You can say, oh, if this didn't work, let me look at the nervous system and find out why it didn't work. Or if something works really well, the nervous system is, is sending you a message that there's something working well there. So it, it's, it is, a, it is a, not a competition to any other system. It's, it's an it's a integration into it, absolutely. And I think, you know, because we're all, you know, wandering this autonomic highway together, this, that, that we should all understand it together. I love the shared language. You know, Tony, you and I could have an email conversation and I could simply say, I, I got a dorsal flavor today and you'd know what that meant. Right? right. I don't tell you anything else. Or you could say, my sympathetic system's really charged. And I might say, ooh, maybe you, you want to go play some music, right? <laughs> we have we have a language. It's a shorthand that is really helpful and is connecting, right? Yeah. Fantastic. We have a question around specifically, um, you know, how long would you let a client stay in their story before you begin to help them move out of the state of fight, flight, and collapse? and or collapse. So how, how long would I let them stay in, in that autonomic state? Okay, yeah. so, so that's a great question. I think with dorsal, we want to be patient. And I think we therapists rush to move somebody out of that state of collapse before their system has had a chance to feel um, accompanied there. See, this is the word I use. I accompany my client. So I'm anchored in ventral, but I can be with my client when they're in dorsal and I can help them understand they're not alone because the, 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 the flavor of the, the quality of dorsal is I'm alone, abandoned, lost where no one will ever find me. That's the common response you hear from people in, in a true dorsal um, experience. And so the antidote to that is you're not alone. I'm right here with you. And I'm gonna stay here with you, bringing my ventral regulating energy and see what happens next. And there's no, you don't have to do anything. We're not in any hurry. And as soon as you make that kind of connection to somebody in, in dorsal, their system feels seen, feels connected with, and things begin to happen. In sympathetic, it's a very different experience because they're full of energy. It's overwhelming energy that is chaotic. And so when someone's in sympathetic, my job is to meet them there again from my ventral, but I'm gonna bring energy to it. Wow, there's a lot of chaotic energy going here. How might we organize that energy so that it can be used in a different way? That's what we're looking for in sympathetic. And so, yes, I'm not gonna, and, and I was just writing something. Um, calm up is what I say now because on the hierarchy, there's ventral sympathetic dorsal. In sympathetic, we tell people, calm down. We wanna help you calm down. No, we wanna calm up. We wanna use that energy and come up, organize it so you can use it from a ventral state of safety and connection. So um, sympathetics probably you know, takes a little less time to move somebody from sympathetic back to ventral. Dorsal, you have to be more patient. And in order to do that, you have to be comfortable in your own system being with someone in a dorsal collapse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great point. That was going to be my next question. Are there ways that we can assess our own system, you know, and uh, kind of quickly as we start to think more about this work and our own nervous systems? Yeah, there's, you know, really the, the first way to befriend your nervous system is, is my, the first map I created, the personal profile map. Um, and um, it, it just helps you get to know your three states, thoughts, feelings, behaviors, beliefs, um, how it how it comes to life for you. Once you've done that, then then the question is, notice the name, where am I in this moment? Right? Because if I know where I am, then I know, oh, I'm in ventral, move forward, or I have slipped into sympathetic or dorsal, need to come back to ventral before I can engage in whatever. So it really is that that process, that first information gathering, getting to know my system so that I can then use it in some way. Yeah, yeah. Great, so that is that map on your website? No, but you know, if, if you want, I'll send you the okay. PDF of the map and the basic mapping directions and you can send oh, that wow. out. Thank you, that would be amazing. Mm. Wonderful, okay. 
We have a few more questions we have time for. How do you account for environmental factors that may keep people in a survival state? For example, for example, non-trauma-informed clinic policies, institutional spaces, et cetera. Oh boy, yes. And don't they just send cues of danger? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we're actually working with um, some organizations to become polyvagal informed organizations. And that's what we, that's one of the things we look at. You know, just your, who answers the phone? How do they answer the phone? What's the first contact? What's the paperwork? How's it done? Yeah, and it, it, it is a, that is a big process. So if you're working in, um, you know, a, an agency that, you know, is sending cues of danger in this way, you know, when you meet your client, you're going to have to you know, do some cleanup of that. And hopefully you'll be able to make some changes in the processes and procedures that that are happening before your client gets to you. Because you know, by the time our client gets to us, you know, in in, in real in if we're ever back in agencies in real life, <clears throat> they have gone through a whole bunch of autonomic experiences before they open my office door and sit. The same is true on, you know, on these virtual platforms. Before my client arrives here with me, their nervous system has had a, an adventure. You know, and, and the first thing we want to do is arrive together and then say, where are you right now? Right, because again, if you're not anywhere near ventral, this is our first job, is to help come back to ventral. You know, I even the the assessment um, information when you do do an assessment, we've started to, you know, work with people to sort of change that um, process because um, it's a very disengaging process, disconnecting process, right? And so, I always talk my interns to know what is on that assessment so that you can simply be having a conversation for the first session. And then, you know, if there are things you didn't miss in the second session, you say, well, I just have a couple of questions I didn't quite get to. But the first, there's no paper, there's no pen, there's no nothing. It's just you and me having a conversation, getting to know um, the things that will end up on an assessment. But, but in a, this is about relationship because the nervous system needs to feel safe in relationship. Mm. Wow, that's amazing that you're working with organizations to be polyvagal informed. And how different would that be from trauma informed? So we work a lot with organizations on becoming more trauma informed, mm -hmm. and, and there is some overlap. But there are there do seem to be some differences. Could you yeah, talk? About and it's that? interesting because you and I would have to sort of um, talk about what is your definition of trauma informed, because it, it's like you know people talk about about tapping or EFT and well how do you do it or people talk about you know, things have gotten so big, so so broad, that you and I could sit down and say, so what is the definition of trauma form that you're using? And then we could integrate a polyvagal lens and see how they fit. You know, one of the things um, we talked about briefly was um, ACEs and understanding ACE score, which many primary care physicians are now using as a way to begin to get a sense of um, trauma in someone's life. And so that would be step one. Step two would be to understand how did your nervous system respond to those particular adverse childhood experiences? Because we all respond differently. And then we would get a, um, an autonomic profile. Um, Steve and, and the researchers at, um, at the um, Traumatic Stress Research Consortium Lab just published a paper on COVID-19 and, and um, response after. And um, the um, it was, Ner it was not, they, they studied ACEs and nervous system state of regulation, dysregulation. And what made the difference was not ACEs, that, that, didn't, that wasn't statistically significant, but the nervous system state, how dysregulated someone was as they went into that had a, um, had a huge effect. So it's interesting to begin to, to look at it in these ways, to add this next layer of, um, the, the biology, your biological response and your, what we call, you know, habitual survival patterns. Mm. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much. So, so fascinating. Yeah. But okay. So uh, we have, I think we have time for one more question. What would you suggest for a new social worker, such as myself, who has only been in the field for about two years to begin to build my knowledge on this topic? Ay, ay, ay. I know. I, and I get this, I get this a lot. Um, so um, and I know new so social workers because I am a social worker and I was a new one once. Um, you know, finances are, are tight and all of that. Um, 
on my website, I have a lot of um, webinars, podcasts that are all um, there for people to, to listen to. Um, on the Polyvagal Institute website, we are just creating a, it's a four and a half hour um, on demand basic intro that will include some experiential practices and hopefully will be priced um, inexpensively for, for people to be able to, um, to begin to learn. Um, because, you know, I, deeper training programs then begin to cost, you know, a lot more, more money. And um, it's, it's, it's hard in these times to, to find the, the way in between. I have a, a Foundations One training series, and you can find that through the um, Polyvagal Institute. I do it through them now, and we offer scholarships for each um, training cohort that we do. So, you know, if, you're, if someone's interested in that, they can um, find that info there and just let, let us know that we'd like to be on the list for a scholarship. So we're trying to, you know, bring as many people as we can into our polyvagal community. Mm. Great, we appreciate that. And as a reminder, this conversation is actually a precursor to our two-part virtual clinical intensive um, where we're working with you and your Polyvagal Institute to hold that. So if you all, I think it's full, everyone, I apologize, but you can get on a waiting list um, and we, we may get to you. So I just wanted to let make sure everybody had that information. Um, Tony, do you have any last thoughts or questions? No, no, it's just, uh, first of all, I appreciate how engaged folks were and your skill to be able to engage everyone. I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of ventral stuff going on. <laughs> which you got it. Really, which is really, really great. So first of all, I just want to thank you, Deb, for just an, an excellent uh, conversation that we've had. I can see that it really piqued a lot of folks' interest and they were very grateful uh, to what you had to share with them. And then, um, you know, we'll be seeing you again, I guess, in the uh, next uh, two, which is, I think folks are going to be <clears throat> extremely interested in, which is fantastic. So I want to thank you and thank all the participants for their really, they were very thoughtful and some really excellent questions and comments that we heard coming in. Mm -hmm. And wishing everyone just, um, you know, very, be safe, stay in ventral, <laughs> at least as much as you can, uh, you know, and, and find out what are those um, activities and events and situations that kind of help you get into vent. That's the other part of it, mm -hmm. right? For us to uh, better understand people, places, and things mm -hmm. that facilitates our, you know, kind of getting in touch with our ventral side. And that's that's an area maybe we'll hear more about mm -hmm. in subsequent, uh, you know, trainings. So thanks everyone. Thanks Deb again and Kara and Fung for really setting up an excellent program. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. All right, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>